do have. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> They keep you company. <clears throat> okay, gentlemen, we are live. Good morning, April. Good morning, sir. Uh, Brother Danny, would you open us with a prayer and uh, put Glendy on your prayer list because she's one of our members who's in the States with a severe cancer right now, and her Is husband that... can't go visit her. What, Glendy? Glendy? Glendy. Yes. Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you, your wonderful throne, and we know how much you love us and care for us. We pray for Glendy as she's cared for. We also pray for so many uh, in this world that are sick and suffering. Uh, we know we have many here with uh, COVID. We know, Father, that it's in the Philippines and all over the world. But Father, we trust in you, and we are looking forward to learning more of your wonderful word. Thank you, Father, for your care, your concern. And thank you, Father, for giving us this word that we can grow thereby. Be with our brethren there in the Philippines and all over, in every other place in the world. Father, forgive us of our sins. Father, we wouldn't know what to do without you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Rick, the floor belongs to you. All right. Uh, well, Brother Ernest, I would like to do it the way we did it uh, last time. Uh, would you call on uh, uh, the students to read? Hold on. You muted. I did, but I don't know how. Oh, okay. How's that? Now we can hear you. Yes, I will call on the students as we go around the room. Great. All right. So we're going to begin uh, our lesson tonight in the book of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter uh, 21, Beginning in verse number 23, we have a confrontation between Jesus and the chief priest and the elders over the very subject matter that we're going to be dealing with here tonight, and that is the need for authority. And uh, so in Matthew chapter 21, if we could uh, uh, read verses 23 through 25. Sister Doe, unmute me. Okay. Matthew 21, 23 through 25. I'll read it. Yes, please. Okay, Matthew 21, verses 23 to 25. Jesus entered, entered yes. the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you going to these things? They asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am do doing these things. John, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? All right, what is interesting about this particular passage and this discussion between Jesus and the chief priest and the scribes is the fact that they both recognize, even though they're going to disagree and are uh, uh, spiritual opponents, you might say, they're going to understand that all men need authority and also going to understand that there in reality are only two sources of authority. 
So they want to know from Jesus uh, what authority and who gave him this authority. And he says, fine, I'll answer that question if you answer mine. The baptism of John, what authority was it from? Did it come from heaven or men? Those are the only two categories of authority that you have. But what I want us to focus on at this point is the fact that both parties realized that there was a need for authority. You know, it is a shame that in so many places in the world, there is not a understanding of the need for authority. But there is a definite need in all matters of life. It doesn't matter whether or not it's the home or in a business or in uh, government, there is always a system of authority. Now, if you don't have uh, what we would call a legitimate system of authority, then you're going to have an illegitimate system of authority. And what's going to reign there is chaos and anarchy. Uh, you're going to have what uh, we would refer to as might makes right. That is, whoever is the biggest and the strongest, uh, whoever has the, uh, uh, the biggest gun or the biggest army, they're the ones who determine. Uh, if there is no authority in a legitimate way, then there is only going to be chaos and anarchy. And in fact, in many places of the world, that's exactly what we see. And uh, if you think about it as well, evil is going to fail when there is no authority, especially if there is no legitimate authority established by God. And so God is the ultimate of authority. Everyone else has what we would call delegated authority. That is, I have authority in my home, but not because of who I am, but because of the fact that God gave me authority over my children, that God gave me authority in the home with regards uh, to my wife, that God gave a certain amount of authority to individuals. That is determined by God. If you don't have that, then you have chaos, anarchy, and evil that will reign. And in fact, there is absolutely nothing good that is accomplished, nothing worthwhile that can be accomplished without uh, legitimate authority. Now, uh, you take a society uh, and uh, you begin to uh, uh, take away its system of authority, and what you have is a complete breakdown of that society. When there is no authority in the home, when parents uh, do not parent their children, when they do not bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4, then uh, 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 the children uh, are in chaos and anarchy, and, and then there's going to be evil that comes about in that home. That is true in any social aspect of man's life. So there is absolutely a need for authority. And in fact, if you, uh, if you press this to its ultimate end, then the only thing that you can have, and you remember the Bible talks about is, as uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, that uh, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so with Jerusalem and that area, there was going to be all of this warfare. A part of that was because uh, the, the Jews had rebelled against the authority that God had placed over them. And uh, so it is important uh, that we recognize that there is a need for authority in this life. I just can't imagine anything that could go on without a system of authority. For example, you take in regards to the church. Uh, God set up a system where uh, his son was in ultimate authority over all things. 
And uh, he created us. If you think about all the way back to Genesis chapter one, he created us in verse number 26 and 27 that we would need authority. Uh, he created man so as to need a woman to be his helpmeet. So man was insufficient uh, without uh, a woman. And so there was this unique relationship that was built up. That social relationship demands that there is a system of authority. So the, the nature of man demands it. In fact, man was created. You know, we use this term sometimes. We talk about free moral agency, that man is a free moral agent. In other words, in matters of morality, basically, I have a freedom to choose certain things. Now, I'm not totally uh, a, a, a free moral agent in the sense that I have absolute control. I'm not a sovereign being. I'm not uh, dipotent. That is, I'm not all powerful. Uh, I can't just choose to do anything that I want. If I want to live on a foreign planet, guess what? I can't just snap my fingers and, and do that. Uh, in fact, there would be absolutely no means with my money system uh, to be able to live on a foreign planet. I don't have that ability. You see, so I'm not I'm not completely free in regards to all of my agency. But with regards to moral choices and regards to decisions that God has placed within my control, I have the ability to choose. Right? I can choose to follow Satan or I can choose not to follow Satan. And uh, I have a choice here between good and evil, between right and wrong. And I can choose to do one over the other. And so I have a capacity for uh, a, a free choice, but also to recognize I can live under authority or I can choose to rebel against that authority, right? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 23. Jeremiah Eddie. 10 and verse number 23. Now, Jeremiah is writing to a group of people who certainly do not appreciate the authority of God. They have rebelled uh, for decades over uh, this uh, system of God. But I want you to notice something very important here. So, do we have someone to read Jeremiah 10, verse number 23? Danny. Uh, oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in? Not in himself. Okay. And it is not in man to direct his own, his steps. own steps. Yes. That's exactly right. So it's not, we don't have the capacity to be able to direct our steps in a right direction. Uh, and you can see this when you take God out of a society, when you take any moral precepts out of society, it will begin to collapse uh, or it will begin to manipulate and uh, seek to destroy all other societies. Uh, how about Proverbs chapter four and verse number 12 here? Uh, 4.12, Chrissy. Fact. Chrissy, your mic. Yes. Proverbs, Proverbs 4.12. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Okay, let's read uh, Proverbs 14 and 12. That's... Uh, 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 my bad there. Proverbs 14 and verse number 12. Oh. Katrina? 12. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Mm -hmm. right. There is a way that seems right to a man. It appears right. Uh, but the end thereof is death. Now, if you look at these two passages together, what you have is man does not have the capacity to properly direct his life 
especially when it comes to moral principles, when it comes to how we handle uh, one another, our social, uh, we don't have the capacity to be able to determine a set of laws. In fact, I challenge people all the time, especially people who claim to be atheist and uh, or people who are skeptical about the Bible. I always ask them uh, uh, this question, uh, produce something that is greater in moral value to humanity than the Bible. You see, atheism and uh, agnosticism, uh, those people who don't believe in God, and, and it, you, when you think about, they have not produced anything of a moral equivalent than to love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, they haven't produced anything that is greater than the humility and the submission of Christ to die for others. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And so uh, there has been nothing that has been produced uh, 2,000 years since Christ has died, and we still do not have a greater, uh, more beneficial and benevolent system uh, than the Bible itself. And so there is a, there is a definite need for uh, authority in the spiritual realm, but man cannot be it. In, in 1 Corinthians, somebody read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 21. Rio. That's 1 Corinthians 1 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Okay, so notice here that, uh, uh, that the, the world through its own wisdom did not know or could not recognize Christ. And they could not recognize the greatest gift that, that was given to humanity. Uh, the wisdom or the Greeks sought after wisdom and the Jews wanted a sign, but God already gave us his wisdom in Christ and he already gave us the sign of the great resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So the absence of authority uh, in religion is a dangerous thing as well. And so it is important that we understand uh, how important uh, authority really is. And the question is, where do we get uh, this authority from. Uh, when you look at uh, the Bible, the Bible is a great history book. And uh, in fact, uh, um, Brother Ernest, let's go to Romans chapter one. And there are several verses there that I want us to read. I, I dealt with this Sunday night for the congregation here uh, in uh, Nesbitt, Mississippi, uh, in uh, introducing them to the book of Romans. Here God places the Gentile world. That would be most of us. Uh, you have the Jew and the Gentile, uh, and we're Gentiles primarily, and uh, that is from the old biblical uh, perspective, the Old Testament perspective. And uh, so we would fall under this particular category here. And uh, beginning in verse number 18, you will see that uh, the wrath of God is revealed against uh, or from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. But uh, Brother Ernest, I'd like for us to read uh, 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 primarily verse number 22, 24, 26, and 28, if we can do that. 22, I'm Eliza. Yes. 24, Mary Fay. April, do you want to read today? Wave at me if the answer is no. Okay. Uh, Mark, you want to get 26 for us? Yes, yes, please. Okay. 22, Annalisa. 
professing to be wise, they become fools. Verify 24, please. Um, verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Mark 26, please. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are uh, contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. I just, should I just keep going? That will go down to 48, if you don't mind. Uh, men committing shameless acts with men, yep, and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. All right, now notice verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So what we've noticed here in this reading, and this is just a portion of it, is that without God, men become foolish, right? Uh, that's verse number uh, 22. They profess themselves to be wise, but they really act foolish. Uh, we've seen that they become unclean and they dishonor uh, their own bodies. And uh, then uh, our brother read uh, where that dishonorableness even goes to the point, and if we might explain, goes to the point of what we would call today uh, uh, women with women and men with men, uh, the lesbian homosexual movement stems uh, from a rejection of God. And so without God, man has, verse number 28, a debase or reprobate mind. Uh, in fact, without God, I become my own standard of authority. So I can do whatever I want, whatever my lust would allow me to do. So if I want to restrict myself, I can be restrictive and say, no, I'm going to deny myself that. Or... I can say, you know what? I want to indulge in every pleasure of the flesh just to see what it's like because I'm the one in authority. But in fact, God is always the one in authority. Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter four. And in Ephesians chapter four, we're gonna find a similar um, section of scripture that talks about the Gentile reprobate mind. So Ephesians chapter 4, and Ernest, let's uh, read verses 17 through 19. All right, Carl, you want to get 17, Doe 18, and Danny 19? Would you repeat that, please? 17, 18, and 19, uh, Carl, Doe, and Danny in that order. Chapter and verse, I mean chapter. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19, Danny. Okay, we cut out. Oh, okay. I've got, I've got the Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. 18, they are darkened in their, in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Danny? All right. Give me the verse again. You cut out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19. Okay. We got it who being past feeling have given themselves over the lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. All right, so I want to ask a question here, and uh, there are actually several answers given in this text, but when it says here that we should not walk after the way of the Gentiles or the way the Gentiles walk, and he describes 
that they walk according to the vanity of their mind. What is the vanity of their mind in verses 18 and 19? If you have an answer, raise your hand. I'll let unmute you. Katrina. The vanity of their mind is whatever, as you as you mentioned before, whatever it pleases them or whatever makes them happy, that is what's right for them. That's exactly correct. In, in fact, notice here he says, they had their understanding darkened, didn't they? Yes. Uh, and they were alienated from the life of God. So uh, through the ignorance that is in them, so you have darkened understanding, you have being alienated from God, you have ignorance, and all of that was because of the blindness of their, I think the, the, the translated, translation was thinking, uh, mind, heart, the, the, the thought process uh, is blinded by that. Have you ever seen a horse uh, in the United States years ago, they used to have horses with blinders on them. And when you're in the, when you're in a lot of traffic, you want horses uh, 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 that have blinders on. And what they do is they allow the horse to look forward, but they can't look from side to side. So they're not distracted by things. Well, there's a lot of people in this world that they live their life with blinders on. They can't see anybody else's needs. They only see themselves. They see what they want and what is before them, and that's all that they see. That is the Gentile mind. Now, in verse number 19, our brother read, and he said that they were also past feeling, right? That they... What does that mean to be past feeling? Let me see. Chrissy, you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> what does it mean to be past feeling? Rio, Mary Faye, weigh in, please. Annalisa. Uh, I really don't have any idea. Is it going to be, um, they become callous? Absolutely. You got it. That, that's it. It's calloused and and it means that I have no ability to feel things anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you walk according to the vanity of your own mind, mm -hmm. then you become past feeling or you will become calloused in your life toward other people. And so that will lead to, as uh, the King James says, and lasciviousness, uh, that's a, that's a word that just simply means I'm given over to the lust of the flesh. Whatever, whatever makes me feel good, that's what I'm going to do. Right. And so that's why they're past feeling. All right. Let me, let, me, let me weigh in here just a touch, if you don't mind, Rick. Sure. Um, everybody think about what I'm getting ready to say, because we're all sinners. And whether that sin was theft, or alcohol, or drugs, the first time you did it, it felt really, really terrible. But after you did it a couple of times, how did you feel about it then? It didn't bother you because you had done exactly what scripture is talking about here and lost your feeling of guilt for whatever sin it was that you were engaged in. You can have the floor back now, sorry. No, that's a, that's a wonderful explanation. You know, sometimes we think that we can control sin. I can dabble in it just a little bit. I can, I can drink just a little bit. I can do this sin just a little bit. I'm in control. The only problem is sin begins to reign 
in us, that means that sin has the control. So sooner or later, let's say I'm doing some, uh, some kind of uh, recreational drugs, as they call it. I'm just doing it for the fun and the pleasure of it. Sooner or later, that drug has a power over me to where now I need that drug and I will be drawn to do whatever is necessary. So I'm past feeling now in regards to that. I think that's an excellent explanation of that. And that's what the, uh, that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us here, that if we walk by our own authority, then, uh, then uh, we're going to develop a calloused uh, heart and mindset toward things of this world. And so it's absolutely essential that we need authority. God's authority is not a bad thing. Sometimes we see authority in a negative light. Uh, somebody has control over me. But in fact, authority is that which allows a system, any system, the system of the family, the system of a government, the system of a business, uh, it allows it to function in a uh, smooth way. It also allows, if you have the right system, it allows for the benefit of both the uh, husband and the wife, both the parents and the children, both the employer and the employee, both the civil government and the citizens who live within it. And so there is definitely a need for authority. And if we go back to our passage that we started with in Matthew chapter 21, what we learn then is that both Jesus and the scribes realized that he needed, they needed authority. But we realize also that there's only two only two sources of authority. Either you can get your authority from God or you can get your authority from men. That's, that's really it. That's all that you have. And so where are we going? Where's the best source of authority? Uh, the creator or the created? The creator. The creator. Absolutely. And so God has uh, our best interest at heart. He created us. He knows what's best for us. Uh, he has our best interest at heart. By the way, how do we know God has our best interest at heart? Yeah. He knows what's good for us. Okay. Very okay. okay. Omniscience, right? That, that's an excellent answer right there. God is omniscient. He knows everything about us, right? So his knowledge uh, then is important in that question, right? All right, what else? How do we Chrissy. know God it benefits us? Well, God um, uh, keeps us safe um, all the time, and uh, he always guides us, and um, he He provides us this Bible for us uh, for as a guide on our journey, on our life. Oh, I, I like that answer because it gets it gets round it, to the heart of the whole matter, doesn't it? Uh, you listen. If if you, I don't know how many people have had children or have children, uh, but you certainly know about parents and children. What kind of parent would I be if I never gave any direction to my children? Irresponsible. I, exactly. I would be an irresponsible parent. And so God is our father. We are his children. He is a responsible parent in the sense that he's given us direction. That's authority, right? All right. So what other way does God demonstrate that he cares for us? He, he, he knows us. He, he's given us direction. And what else? Because he loves us. He gave everything that we need. He provides everything that we want. Ah, excellent. Uh, he created us. 
And if you'll notice in the creation model of Genesis 1, uh, he created us after everything else, right? We, we got here after the, the fruit trees, after the uh, fish of the sea, after the fowl of the air, here when everything else was prepared. Us, God made provision for us. Now, man may want to take that away. And, and sometimes men are ornery. They're mean, they're wicked, and they take benefit that God gives us away from us. But God has blessed us with all of these blessings. What else? There's at least one other thing that I'm he looking He gave for. his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die on the cross for our sins so that we will have eternal you. life in heaven. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. You add all of those things up. And you've got a God who cares about us, right? Yes. That demonstrated in his authority. God never does anything that is against our greatest interest. And we know that by all of the things. And by the way, sometimes we go through trials and tribulations, right? Yes. You know that God can cause and help those trials and tribulations to build character in us. Turn to James chapter one. Uh, Ernest, I don't know how much time we have here, so I want to. I just some... keep going. Rio, it's okay. your read. I think it's uh, your read, Rio. If I'm wrong, chapter... you guys forgive me, right? Well, oh, James chapter one, verses two. Rio, come on, I'm going to go Is it James one? James, James 1, 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Okay. 2, Rio, Annalisa, 3, and Mary Faye, 4. Okay. okay. James 1, 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Produces endurance. Very Faye, muted mo. All right, verse four. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, so notice here that, that God says we're going to encounter trials and difficulties uh, along the way. But what is God able to do with these trials? He says that he's able to work and I think the word in the translation was steadfastness, uh, patience. Uh, he's able to work that in us, but then we have to we have to let that patience or steadfastness have its perfect work, that we may be entire and wanting in nothing. Right. So God is able to use the difficulty of life to make us stronger than we were before those trials. You have to do it God's way. God has a system, and God tells us how to do that. That would be a whole nother lesson, uh, but I might just, in your minds, uh, 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 put in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 10 there, uh, is one of those systems in which he tells us how to do it. But the rest of the book of James, if we'll follow that, then we'll do a good job at uh, learning about the trials of life. So God cares enough to develop a system to help us out, to make us stronger in life rather than weaker. And what happens if I never utilize my muscles? They'll grow weak. The, the, the muscles grow weak, right? And, and it, the whole body begins to grow weak if I don't utilize it. But if I exercise those muscles, they get stronger, right? And so God says, if I exercise his will, Christianity in my life, it will make me stronger. And go through some trials. You know, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, climb a mountain, uh, and listen, I'm kind of a fat boy, so uh, climbing a mountain is not my daily routine. But if I and I said, I want to get all the way to the top of that mountain. Uh, I'm going to go up a little ways. I'm going to get tired. I'm going to be exhausted. 
my my muscles are going to become sore and then I'm going to sit down for a little while. All right. Well, if I do that every day and I do it every day for a year, then I'm going to be way, I'm going to get higher up on the mountain every day, right? Because my muscles are growing stronger. The challenges of life are designed to help us and benefit us. So we're talking about authority, you see, but this is the point that God has developed a system of authority, that's the word of God, and it's designed for our benefit, not for our detriment. And uh, so we need to we need to do as much of our Bible study as we possibly can so as to encourage uh, us to realize the need. By the way, I must respect authority, right? Yes. And what does that mean? If I might just ask just a general question, what does a respect for authority mean? Follow. Okay, it means I follow it, doesn't it? So if if uh, my boss tells me that I need to work in this uh, on this project rather than the other one, then I work on the other project because my boss, my employer, is in authority, right? And follow the precepts of the one that is in authority because, and this is, I think is important, Romans chapter 13 talks about the authority of government, but what it says is there is no authority, but that is appointed of God. In other words, God appointed authority in government, God appointed authority in the home, God appointed authority in the church. God appointed authority in our social relationships, in the family and so forth. And so we ought to follow authority. That's the need for it. And when I, now, uh, I, have a, I have two sons and they're both old now. Uh, one is 35 and I think one is 30 something. But the one that is 30, I think he's turned 30 this year. He lives in Okinawa and uh uh, he's in the military, and he understands what authority is. Uh, but every now and then, I would tell him when he was back home, I would tell him, take out the trash. And he would huff and puff and, and uh, moan and whine and stomp and, and, and just walk off and take the trash out. Now, did he respect my authority when he did that? Church. He did what I asked him to do, but he didn't respect the authority, right? That's it. So it, it's even more than it is following, but it's even more than that. It is willingly and joyfully following. That's what a respect of authority is. All right. I, by the way, I don't know if, uh, uh, Brother Ernest, if you, uh, uh, normally open it up to questions. I've only been here once, but uh, uh, but uh, certainly be willing to, to do that in relationship to our discussion tonight. We can. All right, church, ask away. Mary Fay, you got good questions? No. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of one. Now, I don't have anyone uh, any questions right now. That's all right. Lisa. You know, you know what that means, by the way. If there's no questions, it means one or two things. It means number one, either I didn't stimulate your mind well enough, or number two, I did such a good job I answered all the questions. Right. <laughs> we'll go to number two. I don't yeah. <laughs> You did more. None so far. Okay. Um, I just want to say something. <laughs> Go ahead, Annalisa. Uh, I may hurt. I may hurt people anyway in this world. It just like um, uh, like you have said, it's we have to respect authority, right? And it's like in our generation right now, and every country, every nations, it's just. They have, um, they have this 
LGBT, they are trying to to be uh, to pass it the bill that it will be really. I mean, there are some countries that it is okay already. All, all those kind of oh, I forgot the term. <laughs> I mean, those. I mean, I mean, but there came from the authority from it's because it says in 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 Romans chapter thirteen, every person is is to be subjection to the government authorities, and it's like that. Um, Oh, I forgot the term. It's like from every country, and I mean, most of the countries like US, they already approve that bill. And it's like a, a lot of countries already approve that bill. So, and it's like a uh, Christian would be thinking that because uh, it is read, written in Romans 13 that we should be subject, we should respect the authority, then it would be, they get be a wrong idea about it. I mean, Christian. Uh, <laughs> I forgot the term. Uh, That's okay. Like that. uh, listen, uh, what is important in regards to authority, and I, I think this is uh, somewhat what we're talking about here, is uh, who has the uh, the authority at a particular time. Uh, for example, uh, it, it here in Romans chapter 13, it's talking about government authority, okay. and they have authority over the citizens, but they don't have authority to be able to uh, uh, oppose a law that God has given. And by the way, there are a couple of examples to this in the Bible. I, I know that we probably don't have time to look at all of them, but I want to, uh, uh, I have a responsibility to obey the government or the authority unless that authority is telling me to do something that is contrary to God's will. Now, let me give you a couple examples of this. Pharaoh told the midwives to kill the, the male babies that were born in Egypt or in, yeah, by the Hebrews in Egypt. And they disobeyed him and God blessed them. And uh, they were doing the right thing, even though they were disobeying the government, because the government did not have a right to uh, enact a law that was contrary to God's law, you see. And so you, you have, uh, uh, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter three, I believe it is, that uh, they refused to bow down to the image, even though the image was erected by the government. So they disobeyed the government. Now, they were thrown into the uh, fiery furnace uh, as punishment, but they obeyed God. And uh, so when the government tells us to do that which God has forbidden, then we must obey God, right? Acts chapter 5 and verse number 29, we must obey God rather than men. Now, there's another op opposite side of this. When the government forbids me to do what God said, the government says you cannot do what God said do, then I must disobey the government. Now, I want you to notice here in Daniel's case, in Daniel chapter 6, the government said that Daniel could not pray to any, uh, any other God other than uh, the king and the king's God. What did Daniel do? Daniel went to his house as he had done every single day and he prayed unto his God. Now it cost him to go into the lion's den. God saved him out of the lion's den. But uh, what I'm suggesting here is that authority should always be obeyed except if they violate the principles of a higher authority. Which is good. Uh, the government is a authority over its citizens, but God is a greater authority. And so you, I don't know if that's where you were going, but that's what I got from your uh, comments. And I think that's an excellent study in regards to the need for authority. Because we need to know who to respect. Do I respect, look, by the way, if, if my husband tells me or my spouse, if I'm, if I'm a wife and my husband tells me that I cannot go to church, 
By the way, my wife was uh, my wife's mother was in this situation at one point. Her husband told her uh, not to go to church and not to take those children, and she did anyway. Uh, now, by the way, that example caused her uh, husband to obey the gospel later on, but she had to obey God because God was the higher authority than her husband, you see. That's the way that's supposed to work. So that's an, that's an excellent comment. Rick. Yes, sir. That we're uh, we're going to let Mark close. Mark, do you want to lead closing prayer? Um, yes, yeah, sure. I, I don't know how quite to lead the closing talk prayer. To God. But, He's your buddy. Uh, all, right. Uh, all right. God, thank you for um, having this internet meeting that different parts of the world can come together and that we can um, uh, share uh, the Bible and, and the word and and bring the truth out to us, God, and, and let us let us listen and hear um, directly from the book, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, Rick, church, yes, sir. tell Mr. Rick, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, thank you all. I, I, I appreciate the invite. I enjoy being here. We'll have him back again soon, okay? If you can tolerate me. <laughs> we'd love to see you again soon Mark right, it's always you. nice to see you church we'll see you guys on Sunday Carl I'm going to call you on messenger in a minute and Danny you know how to get in touch with me right all right everybody all right. have a blessed day bye bye now bye bye, bye. 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 bye.